Okay, um, well, thanks for uh, inviting me to give this talk. And actually, I won't be focusing on the deep mantle as it, as it says in the title, but um, actually the whole mantle. Like, like Torsten, I'll start by uh, showing a movie um, of uh, simulation of mantle convection with plate tectonics, um, this time with continents. So it will uh, start moving soon. I see it's first rotated. So this looks um, remarkably like the Earth. All the continents are there in the correct positions. Of course, that's because um, Tobias Rolf, who made this movie, put them in the correct positions. But um, so this is, in, in a way, a prediction of, of future Earth. It's what the, what the continents uh, and the plates will do next. But anyway, it shows the type of calculations that we can do nowadays. We have um, subduction zones like this and spreading centers, and they're generated uh, self-consistently by the rheology, as also in the example that Torsten showed. Um, so the only thing that's imposed is the initial condition here. Everything else is evolving self-consistently. And this model, however, is a bit lacking because it doesn't contain any compositional variations except for the continent. Um, and, but, and that'll be a theme of my um, talk, is thermochemical convection. So I'll be, start by showing a number of uh, cartoons to uh, illustrate various concepts. And um, then I'll focus a bit on the early Earth as a contrast to the present day Earth. And you know, because the structure of the mantle uh, today is a sort of integral of you know, what's been happening over billions of years. So we need to consider the whole sort of history of the Earth, not just what's happening today. So that's anyway my, my excuse for showing some results rel relevant to the early Earth. And um, then I'll, um, different uh, possible origins of heterogeneity are one is recycled crust and the other is um, primordial material. And I'll show some examples of models of both of those examples, or both of those possibilities. Um, well, so when we consider the mantle, we, sh we should consider compositional variations as well as thermal variations um, for various reasons. One is that compositional variations are observed in, in outcrops of mantle rocks. You, know, you get these um, uh, different layers at the scale of tens of centimeters. Um, compositional variations are observed in uh, Geochemistry, looking at trace element compositions of erupted magmas, they find different end members. Um, in seismology, this is, this is by now a sort of old model, but uh, this was an attempt to uh, invert for um, thermal, thermal density variations and uh, compositional va density variations. And um, you notice the amplitude is similar between the two. So according to this inversion, and the, no doubt there are more recent ones now, the sort of amplitude of density variations due to compositional variations is comparable to, to that of thermal variations in the mantle. So there have been various you know, conceptual models of the chemical structure of the mantle. Some of these, I think, can, can be ruled out. Um, they're not really contenders nowadays. But uh, anyway, so there are different types of material. Uh, the purple is, is prim primitive or primordial. Um, the green is, is the depleted more mantle. And then there's recycled crust, which is uh, in, in this uh, color. So there have been different possibilities. One, one is that uh, there's just a layer of anomalous material at the bottom, or maybe a larger undulating layer, or maybe you know, <coughs> plums of uh, primordial material, which is sort of related to what uh, these beams that Maxime is, is uh, proposing. Anyway, um, so it's all very well to come up with lots of cartoons, but um, we need to test them with dynamical models. Another thing, uh, possibility that was proposed 2007 by Stefan and, and uh, colleagues was this um, basal magma ocean that um, <clears throat> you would have had uh, melting at the bottom. Well, <clears throat> you started, if you started with a, um, a global deep magma ocean, then it would have crystallized from, from the sort of mid-lower mantle um, in both directions. And the basal magma ocean could survive potentially for uh, up to billions of years and explain even the um, UL disease today. Whereas the surficial magma ocean cools much more rapidly because it's exposed to the surface. Um, and then there have been other concepts proposed for, for generating uh, major element and trace element heterogeneity. There's the transition zone water filter, which is a way of 
trapping um, water and incompatible trace elements in the transition zone, these upside down differential differentiation idea, which is that you would actually, in the early Earth, when the mantle was hotter, you could get partial melting you know, deep, deep in the mantle, uh, particularly in the transition zone. Um, and then you, you, you would have this sort of internal differentiation that um, is not related to the formation of crust. You know, today, we, th we think of the formation of crust as being the main differentiation mechanism. But early on, when it was hotter, you would have had uh, other mechanisms, potentially. So um, <clears throat> possibly many of these mechanisms are or were operating at the same time. So I think it's probably not a good idea just to focus on one, one thing and, and propose that this explains everything. And so uh, I attempted to combine several of these mechanisms. So in the, in the early Earth, perhaps there was, a, well, we expect a thicker basaltic crust because the potential temperature of the mantle was hotter. Um, you could have had internal melting uh, and internal partial melting creating differentiation. And um, some of these differentiated products would um, end up at, at the bottom, perhaps joining a basal magma ocean, and um, ending up with a sort of mixture of stuff at the bottom, which I called a basal melange, or BAM for short. So probably shouldn't focus on one, one mechanism. And then uh, fast forward to the present day, you know, this, this mixture of materials that built up over time could explain the um, LLSVPs, and there's still ongoing differentiation associated with uh, oceanic crust production and subduction. So we, we have run lots of models in which um, you know, <clears throat> partial melting produces oceanic crust, and then uh, this, this is subducted and, and builds up at various places in the mantle. Uh, sometimes you, you can get it building up at the bottom. Uh, it also builds up um, in the transition zone, something that Maxime will focus on more tomorrow. Um, and so this is one way of generating heterogeneity, but it also has some other implications. And um, Diogo looked at these a few years ago. So, so what's happening here then is this, this is a typical geotherm. This is the solidus. And here you, you, you can get uh, partial melting. And in some of our models, we remove any partial melt immediately and turn it into crust. So you can generate basaltic crust when the temperature exceeds the solidus below the lithosphere. Um, and Diogo found that this actually helps produce plate tectonics. So model A here is um, a model with, with just, just a isochemical, so just a purely thermal model, and uh, it does not develop plate tectonics. For four and a half billion years, it's a stagnant lid planet. Whereas when this melting and crustal production is introduced, then the model displays episodic plate tectonics. So um, it has bursts of plate tectonics, in other words, where the whole lithosphere uh, overturns. So this is interesting that um, it's not the partial melt itself that's helping in this case. It's the production of a variable thickness crust that produces additional stresses that helps uh, you know, break the, uh, the lithosphere and produce plate tectonics. And yes, Diogo made some nice regime diagrams this is a uh, yield stress. This is something else, viscosity. And um, adding melting and crustal production shifts the regime boundaries to the right, which means to higher yield stresses. So that allows you to get uh, episodic or mobile lithosphere behavior at higher, higher yield stresses. So in a way, yes, partial melt does help plate tectonics, but not by the direct uh, mechanical effect of the, of the melt itself. Um, but those models assume that uh, all of the melt generated below the plates went to produce uh, basaltic crust. However, um, in nature, in the Earth, um, it, it's thought that a lot of the melt that's produced goes to intrusive magmatism instead of extrusive magmatism. And this is expected to have a quite different mechanical effect because when you keep um, putting cold cold basalt on the top and then burying it with more cold basalt, you end up with a, a cold crust and lithosphere. And cold tends to be strong. Whereas if you keep injecting you know, hot magma into the crust, then this will tend to warm up the crust. So here we expect a, a warm, weak crust. Um, so this 
is expected to have quite different um, dynamics, and it does. So these are models by Diogo. Here's one with purely extrusive magmatism, and you see that there, there was a sort of burst of subduction. This is composition here, so red is, is crust. This is temperature. This is viscosity, and this is melt. So, and then, and then um, well, what we're seeing is bursts of subduction, and then it's, it's stagnant for a while, and then you get another burst. This is the time in billions of years. And there is a secular change. So actually, towards the end, uh, you get more continuous subduction. Um, yeah, now we're getting more, more frequent uh, subduction events. And by the end, it'll, it'll settle into almost um, steady subduction as the mantle cools and sort of balance of stresses changes. Yes, okay, but now compare that to a model in which 90% of the melt produced intrudes into the lithosphere at the base of the crust. Well, now you will see much more continuous behavior. So it doesn't display this episodicity. You're going from stagnant to the then overturn. But instead, you're getting uh, sort of drips off the, off the base of the lithosphere all the time. And that's because this, this intrusion of melt into the lithosphere is making it weak. And where you know, the, the basalt becomes thick enough to turn to ectogite, then it becomes unstable and it tends to uh, drip to the bottom. So quite different dynamics uh, caused by just a different assumption about what happens to partial melt below the lithosphere. And so this, this turns out to be a new, a new regime. When you plot a regime diagram. Um, this is yield stress versus extrusion rate. Um, you find this, this regime that I just showed, which we've named plutonic squishy lid, um, actually doesn't depend on the value of the yield stress. So th this can, can uh, take place even, even if you don't have any um, plastic yielding in your model. And here's um, <clears throat> Antoine Rosel's cartoon to explain what's happening. Um, so what happens is that uh, you get melt in, sort of intruded into, into the lithosphere, not everywhere at the same time, but in certain places, and that weakens those places. And then you can get sort of lateral motion of, of regions of the lithosphere um, accommodated by these, these weak zones caused by melt intrusion. Now, so we think this is relevant to the early Earth. It's not relevant to um, today's Earth, but it would be relevant to the early Earth when there was a lot more magmatism than there is today. And previously, people have done studies, people like Jerome Van Hoonen, uh, showing that subduction uh, wouldn't work or wouldn't have worked in early Earth. So this is a, a successful model of subduction, which represents today. But when you try running the same model with a higher ambient temperature, like 100, 200, or 300 degrees, then the subduction doesn't... Uh, continue, you just sort of the slab breaks off and then, and then the subduction stops. So we you know, propose that this plutonic squishy lid mode is what happened in early Earth when the mantle was hotter before subduction took place. And this is also supported by regional models. So Taras and Elena and other uh, co-workers are, have, have run and are running models like this representing the early Earth. This is just the top 200 kilometers. Uh, not the whole planet, but uh, you do get you know, partially molten asthenosphere, you get the partially molten crust, and you get all this, this dripping of the lower crust um, that we also saw in the global models. So the fact that you get something similar in very well-resolved regional models uh, gives us some confidence that the global models are reasonable. Now, another thing that was happening early on is impacts. So it is thought that... Um, perhaps 1% of the mass of the Earth was added after its main accretion by impacts, and that this might have occurred as a late heavy bombardment. So there are these models that have been proposed. Uh, this is Morbidelli et al. model. This, this is 4.5 billion years ago, 3.5 billion years ago, and there was an initial sort of decrease in the number of impactors and then an increase about 4 billion years ago, the late heavy bombardment. And the late heavy bombardment added the late veneer, which is something that geochemists like to talk about. Um, so 
But what is the mechanical effect of all of these impacts? And um, you know, this is from Marchi et al. This, this is the sort of location of the impactors or the impact craters um, three and a half billion years ago. So according to, according to this, the, the number of impactors, well, this, this sort of looks like the surface of the moon. It's completely saturated by impacts. And so all of these impactors must have had some mechanical e and thermal effect on the early Earth. And so this was explored by Craig O'Neill very nicely in 2017. Uh, he published 2D models. We, we have been running 3D models. And <clears throat> so this is a 500-year interval, 500-million-year interval. Um, on the left, you see a model with no impacts. And on the right, you see a model with impacts taking place. See, that's what these circles are. So the, in the left model, nothing much is happening. The, the crust is gradually thickening. But um, in the right-hand model, with a, a reasonable sort of dis distribution of impactors coming in, there's a lot happening. Um, yeah, you see, in fact, some uh, movement of, uh, you see some subduction, you see some lateral movement of, uh, of regions looking like uh, plate tectonics. See, this is, this is before the uh, late heavy bombardment. Then it suddenly, you said, get this sudden increase. And what we're looking here actually is at the, um, is the compositional field. So, um, yes. So we definitely see some, some sort of short-lived plate tectonics induced by impact. And um, let's look at, look at this movie now. And uh, maybe the, the, the thing to focus on is this, the strain rate. So this is the strain rate in the outer part of the planet. And um, yes, every time there's an, there's an impact, you get some uh, high strain rate events and things moving around. Um, so it seems you know, that this, this should definitely be, or was definitely a factor uh, in the early Earth, sort of the first billion years of Earth evolution. And if we want to understand early Earth tectonics, we should include the effect of impacts in our models. Um, so yeah, you, you sometimes hear this view of, of early Earth as being that the, the lithosphere was basically rigid, nothing, nothing was happening, and then we had to think of some reason why plate tectonics started. But according to the models I've been showing here, you know, the early Earth was actually very dynamic. There was lots of magmatism. The magma, magma was weakening the, the uh, lithosphere and enabling it to deform and move around. And impacts were doing the same thing. So we don't really need any sort of special mechanisms to, to start uh, subduction early on. There was a lot going on. Another point uh, here, actually, is that after the impacts die out, the planet goes back to being a stagnant lid. So you know, it's not that the Earth was sort of waiting, <laughs> just waiting for some uh, kick to start plate tectonics. It's, um, it's getting plenty of kicks here, but uh, plate tectonics doesn't survive after the impacts have stopped. But of course, this depends on, on the assumed value of yield stress. So um, impact can certainly break a stagnant lid, giving temporary mobility and subduction. But when the impacts stop, a stagnant lid returns if you know, the, the system wants to be stagnant lid. So you can't just um, you know, force plate tectonics this way. But if, if it's Anyway, mobile lid behavior, then these impacts don't make that much difference to the average dynamics. So moving on now to the long-term evolution, uh, we, we have run a lot of models with um, production of basaltic crust that, that can then be subducted and often builds up at the bottom. And a key point is that this um, subducted crust at the bottom, plus any material that was there from the beginning, greatly influence the geodynamo. So just to refer to the most recent um, Nakagawa and me paper. Um, so here we have um, a model with only basalt that some of which segregates at the bottom, as has happened in various models since 1994. Uh, and this, is, this focuses on the evolution of the core. Okay, so this is the core mantle boundary temperature. The core cools as heat is taken out of it. This is the inner core size. And yeah, in these models, the core cools too quickly. And in fact, in some models, the core becomes completely solid because it cools so much. 
So, and this, this is a general um, problem in, in these models where you're tracking core evolution. If you don't, if you just have thermal convection, then uh, it's difficult to stop the core from cooling too much um, over geological history. And so, in, at least in these models, it's really necessary to have a compositional um, layer at the bottom made of uh, subducted basalt or primordial material or some combination of the two, as, as in these models, to reduce the heat flux and you know, allow the geodynamo to continue over geological history without freezing the whole core. So these models have a combination of a dense primordial layer, shown in red here, and subducted basalt. And in these models, we can obtain realistic present-day core temperature and inner core size. So finally, let's, let's talk about the, um, the influence of the, of the viscosity of these possible piles of dense material above the core mantle boundary, which may you know, be present in LLSVPs. So I'll just highlight a couple results from a couple of papers, one by Langer, Mayer, Lohmann, and myself, one by uh, Yang Li, Frederic Deschamps, uh, some other people who I don't have photographs of, and um, yes. So, well, you might, five minutes, two minutes, okay, yes. Um, wonder why, why there should be a, a, dense, a viscosity difference of this material, and uh, well, well, firstly, it, it's, it's hot down there, so, just from temperature, we would expect it to have a lower viscosity. But um, it may also have an intrinsic compositional density difference, perhaps because of its different composition, different water content, different iron content, different grain size. You know, the grains can grow. So one, one can make several arguments why the viscosity might be different intrinsically. And then, um, so let's look at some models. Here, here's a composition, dense material. Here's temperature. So, uh, um, we'll be looking at different uh, sort of de uh, density contrasts. When the density contrast is less, the, the topography of these piles is higher, as is well known. And um, this is showing the effect of viscosity contrast from 0 0.1 to 30. And it doesn't have a huge influence on the morphology and topography, but it does have a, a note no one that you can notice. Um, Basically, when the intrinsic viscosity is higher, then you cannot get internal convection within these piles, whereas here you do get internal circulation in the piles. And then, so they become hotter, basically, and less stable. And if you're close to the stability threshold, this means that they can actually, you know, go unstable and um, disappear. Yes. Um, another point from these calculations, as well as others that people have published, is that um, the piles don't stay in the same place for billions of years. Instead, they, they sort of move around. They're influenced by subduction. They can split up, join together, and so on. This is also shown by these 3D models, which span a time period of one billion years. You see the piles sort of moving around, changing, splitting up, merging. Yes. Um, so I'll just make, make the final point that this viscosity contrast also has a substantial influence on the core mantle boundary heat flux. Um, now, this is <coughs> a busy graph that shows the influence of three different uh, parameters, but focus on the colors which show the viscosity contrast. And this is basal heat flux. And the blue points, th these are the ones with the low viscosity dense material, have the higher CMB heat flux. So this is important for the evolution of the core, for the long-term evolution of the, the Earth. So just to summarize, um, likely, you know, at the bottom of the mantle, any, any piles are likely to be a mixture of materials, uh, not a single thing. Um, early Earth, we think it was something like this plutonic squishy lid uh, dynamics, also impacted by impacts. Um, Piles of dense material at the CMB have a strong influence on CMB heat flux and may even be needed to explain the evolution of the geodynamo. And uh, the actual viscosity of these piles uh, does influence the heat flux and their stability. Okay, thank you.